Welcome everybody um, to the June 2021, uh, I was going to say issue, you in, um, in know, session, whatever. Anyway, welcome to our club meeting for the Utah Valley. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Utah Valley Amateur Radio Club. Welcome everybody. Glad you're here. Um, glad I'm here. And um, I think we're going to have a bit of fun tonight. Um, we've got a few people that's um, some key people that are missing this evening. And, and um, I'm going to take, I've already failed. Okay, I, I'm going to take some suggestions of some people who have texted me and, and they keep saying, no, G, slow down. So I'm going to slow down and not talk quite so fast. Anyway, welcome everybody. So let's go ahead and get started by, let's see. Opening prayer, Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, let's turn it over to Carl first for some um, information and business about upcoming events. Take it away, Carl. All right, a couple of things. Um, first, the uh, 76 barbecue, 76ers barbecue will be on July, uh, June 12th. I've said July, I don't know how many times. June 12th. We usually go uh, between about 10 and 3, come out and help Noji put up uh, an antenna uh, starting at about 9. Uh, we'll make sure the gates open for the uh, pavilion at that time. It's at Highland Glen Park, which is just uh, on the road there from uh, uh, Lone Peak uh, High School uh, down the hill. It's a nice park if you haven't been there. It's got a little four-acre lake and um, pond or whatever you call it. It's got fish in it. And uh, we usually have a chicken barbecue plus potluck. And um, there's a sign-up sheet on the 76ers um, Facebook group. If you want to sign up or just bring something, we usually eat around noon. I'll be doing barbecue chicken. I know um, Doug, uh, WE7BBQ, will, is, is, is coming with his um, uh, hush puppies. And I know that uh, my wife is doing uh, her calico beans at as she does every year, but uh, it's a great park. There's gonna be some drawings, raffles, bring your uh, spare change for, buy some extra tickets to Seven Sixers. Uh, we'll give them a free ticket. And then if you wanna increase your chances for uh, the drawings on radios and antennas and different things like that, uh, that's how we fundraise that, uh, that event. It's a Highland Glen Park, June 12th, 10 to three. We usually start cleaning up about three and, um, come out and uh, go to face to face with the uh, seven sixers and everybody else. We have a get on the air station. No, G's going to put up a HF station. I don't know if we're going to have a Fox on, but we usually have a Fox on every year. And it's uh, it's always a lot of fun. Venus will be there. She claims that she's going to be there. And if Venus can be there at what? 95. I think she just turned 96. Yeah. If Venus can be there. I think any of us can be there. And uh, well, like I always say, don't let some lame family reunion get in our way. Um, anyway, did anybody got any questions on that? I'll field them. All right. For the next thing, uh, our next meeting will be an in-person meeting. I think we've all been waiting for that. Get out of this COVID funk. Uh, it is going to be July the 1st, which is a Canadian Independence Day, by the way. Some of us take a holiday and go north. I don't know if I'm going there or not, but... Uh, Anyway, uh, I think it'll be at the usual times here, uh, and it will be at the uh, Orem um, City Hall, like it has been in previous uh, years, and uh, hopefully we have a good turnout there. Uh, it seems like we've had anywhere from 80 to sometimes over 100 people there, and um, and uh, for those who haven't been there or haven't been a member of the club for that long, it's always a great meeting. Anyway, um, I think it's the same time as it is now. Uh, am I correct, Noji? Yes, um, but there's a news flash, however. Um, so Orem says that um, we will actually have our first meeting on August 5th after all, instead of July. August 5th, though, not July? That's right, yes. So our July 1st meeting will be a virtual meeting again? Well, no, um, actually we're kind of arguing and fighting about what's gonna happen in July. So there, July 1st will not be our meeting. Instead, we're gonna meet at some off time and and uh, I think we're gonna be outside in a park 
and we're going to do something crazy. But Karen and uh, Lauren are kind of driving us somewhat. All right. Sounds like a plan. Okay, well, let's delay that. Our next meeting will be in our, our uh, first uh, in-person meeting will be in August then. Anyway, that's about all I had. I actually looked on the uh, the website and so I got wrong information there, Noji. My um, anyway, anybody have any questions on that? All right, I'm ready for a meeting. All right, one more thing, Carl. Um, so. You know, I, I guess I keep being premature about this one more thing, but um, aren't we having an ice cream social sooner or later then, too? Now, say again, you're talking about ice cream social? Yes, sir. Well, we usually do that like September or sometimes even October, depending on how the weekends fall and stuff like that. But it, when we do that, we'll be doing that in Orem at the... Um, um, Leather Bees in Orem when we do that. Uh, and it'll... We'll, We'll have some more. Uh, we'll have some more announcements about that down the road. We got to uh, get through this. We got to get through the summer first. Well, believe it or not, that um, that ice cream social is only um, five weeks away. Oh, okay, but no, eight weeks away. Anyway, so it's getting closer. Well, see, that's how anxious I am for that ice cream social. I, I really like that. So anyway, thanks, Carl. Appreciate it. Um, uh, let's see. Next up is uh, Wendy with a couple of things. Go ahead, Wendy. All righty, thanks. You can hear me okay? You bet. All right. Uh, June 26th and 27th will be the field day. Uh, it is a camp out, a practice, a contest, a picnic. We're going to have some fun. Um, up by Strawberry on our website, uvark.club. You look up field day information. It has where, when, and maps and videos to get there. So you can have an opportunity to look through that over <laughs> and see where you wanna, how you wanna participate. You can bring a camper, a trailer, a tent, or just come up for a couple of hours. It's an opportunity to get on HF, which is about the only time I do uh, HF uh, during the year. And then secondly, we have a second announcement is um, utahvalleyswapmeet.com. And that is going to be September 25th at the Spanish Fork North Park Grand Pavilion, where you can buy and sell your uh, amateur radio, uh, find things for improving or extraneous stuff to pass on to others so they can learn about it too. So that is also at utahvalleyswapmeet.com. So all that information is there. The cost, the uh, if you want a table, that sort of information, and that's September 25th. Back to no G. All right, thank you very much, Wendy, appreciate that. You know, one good thing about swapping you find out is that, um, uh, anyway, the, the the big thing is that one man's trash is another man's trash. So it just kind of works out that way. Anyway, thank comment. you very much, Wendy. Appreciate that. Comment? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, comment. Uh, she brings up field day. I'm probably going up there on um, either Wednesday afternoon or Thursday morning early, one of the two. I'm not sure yet. I've got a uh, half a week off. But uh, we need somebody to pull. If I go up, I don't like to leave the uh, club trailer uh, unattended, but I need, I can't pull two trailers at once. If somebody has some time and wants to tow the little, um, uh, calm trailer for the, for the club up, uh, with me or after me or something like that, uh, I, you, you'd love to hear a volunteer. Okay. So you're not talking about the calm trailer. You're talking about the, the, the club trailer, right? Yeah. The club, the club calm trailer, the little, uh, oh, the one yeah. I have at my house here. Okay. Cause someone else is already towing up the comm trailer. Um, that's Chad Bocut's trailer. But um, yeah, so we need, we're looking for someone to tow, tow the club, the little club trailer, right? That's that's correct. That's correct. Okay. Well, let's see if we can post that and get some volunteers on that then. I might be able to help just by what my work schedule is, but I might be able to help you. <clears throat> uh, that's, that would be so good if you could bring there, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Uh, comment? 
Go ahead, yes. Hey, no, just a real quick question on that. I had signed up to haul the comm trailer. Is thinking back to Winterfield Day, that's just the trailer that has the the mesh network system on it, right? That's correct. Okay, I, I wasn't sure if it was that trailer or if it was the club trailer, but now that I know, I'm, thank you. I've, I've got a better idea of what I'm hauling now. Yeah, it's pretty small. And it's not it's not hefty or anything. You don't need much to pull that thing. Well, thanks, Alex. Appreciate it. And Carl, you're going to be up there September 28th. Is that right? Is that when you needed it up there? What's that now? You needed it. You needed to haul it up there September 28th. No, this is in this is in June now. I'm talking wrong month. Sorry. <laughs> See, uh, I'll be. I I have to look at my calendar here, but I think it's uh, the Wednesday or Thursday before uh, field day. There, we usually go and make a four day, a uh, four day camp out trip out of it and try and secure up our spots. Right. So that'd be June. Let me look at my schedule here. I'm retiring the end of September, so. Uh, Hey, Carl, I am planning on going up the Tuesday before field day so we can get some good spots. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good, Joe. I, I, I know that we uh, there's a few of us to try and do that. And I and I, I thought you might be taking the some or somebody might be taking the porta potties up. I'm not sure. But anyway, I was looking for a volunteer for the uh, for the club trailer. Be the 23rd. All right, very good. Thank you very much, Carl. All right. Well, next up, we've got um, some uh, some new hams and some uh, some upgrades. And uh, we didn't get quite as many as we did last time because we didn't have a big exam session like last time. So I'm going to read off uh, some of the names that I've got here. Um, I'll be really quick about it. So I've got uh, KG7YQK with Nathan Stewart, YRN, Brennan Clement, YRO, Christopher Holm, YSI, William Welsh, YBA, Gary Wilson, YBS, Hyatt Carroll, YBT, Melissa Clegg, YBU, Spencer Colbert, YVV, Randall Eaves, YBX, Robert Huntington, YVY, Curtis Meinhardt, YVZ, Bentley Myers, YWA, Kurt Myers, um, YWB, Jared Oldham, YWD, Andrew um, Says, YWE, Shirley Smith, YWF, M Amber Sweeney, and uh, uh, let's see, YWG, Jean Tessier, YWQ, Michael Heron, YWY, Mara Gower, and YYV, Tony Sweeney. Give these guys a big hand, please. Congratulations on getting your HEM exam, HEM, HEM license. And we got four upgrades this month. We have um, Gage Blackwell, KG7PXR, who's got his extra. Um, and uh, Kay Hauser, KG7YGL, who got his general. Uh, Patrick Ricks, N7PJR, who got his general. And Ed Nashell, N9EDN, who's got his extra. Congratulations to those gentlemen. Or lady, I assume he is a gentleman. I don't know. Anyway, very good. By the way, I've got some really sad news. And that is that we have two members of our club who just reported in at the Orem City Council Chamber Room. And I had to text them and let them know that um, that that if they just go to their phone, they're at the right place. So, you know, at any rate. Um, and as a matter of fact, th those two people are two who I just read off whose names are on here. But I'm not going to mention the names because I don't want to shame them. Anyway, kind of sad, but hey, kind of fun. All righty. Well, let's see. At this time, I think we're caught up. So I think it's time to turn the time over to John. John, is this a good time to hand you the microphone? And, uh... Hey, it's always a good time to be DXing, right? Oh, very good. Yes, John has given us a presentation in the past and done a wonderful job, and he's done such a great job that we were so glad when he um, uh, wanted to do another presentation for us, and it was just just a wonderful thing. And uh, John's very experienced in DX, has a great history in ham radio, 
has done so much for so many people. And to say what John has done for others and stretched his neck out and tried to help others uh, would just feel, you know, volume. So uh, I just want to go on. But anyway, John's a great guy. I highly recommend getting to know him. If you ever get the chance to meet him, he sometimes comes to our club meetings and and uh, when he does, uh, he, he attracts people. He's a great guy. Anyway, John, it's the, the mic is all yours. Well, thank you, Noji. Uh, I hope my head, head hasn't gotten too big. I don't deserve any any near uh, of that credit, but I appreciate that a lot. So just by way of an introduction, then I'll get into the slideshow. I'm John Mitten, KK7L. I live in Saratoga Springs. We've been out here since 1999. We we're kind of some of the original pioneers out here, one of the first hundred homes. And it just seems every time I turn around, there are more and more of them. So we were fortunate to come out here in the early days when lakefront property weren't, wasn't that expensive. And so I have a, a nice flagpole antenna, which I'll show you a, a photo of here, right on the lake. So propagation is really quite good. I got, uh, I was licensed um, in the mid seventies when I was in high school. That kind of dates me a little bit. And I uh, had a lot of fun with CW back in the day, um, including I did a lot of traffic nets. Uh, back then there was a lot of activity with CW traffic nets. And that really got my CW skills uh, uh, sharp. You know, life hits you and over time I uh, you know, ended up going to college, mission, family, all that. And I thought, you know, I want to get back into ham radio. So when we built this house, I decided I'm going to get serious about it and do something on HF. And I had a lot of fun when I was a kid uh, chasing DX. And uh, things have certainly changed uh, since the 70s until today. And that's, uh, that's something that we'll also talk about today. Joining me, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen now. I'm going to go to that and make sure everybody can see that. Is that OK? We're all good? If you can't see, speak up. Um, joining me today will also be Ryan Rumsey, N7DWW. Um, he has a few slides he's going to share. Ryan uh, was our Rookie of the Year at the Utah uh, DX Association last year. Um, he came to me last year with, hey, I want to I wanna set up a, a DX and contacting, uh, contesting station. And I looked him up and I realized he's a technician class. <laughs> I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. Um, but uh, he, uh, he really has taken off and done well. So Ryan will be uh, sharing the mic a little bit today, uh, this evening, as will Bryce Anderson, K7UA. He's a longtime member of the Utah Valley Amateur Radio Club. Uh, he lives, I believe it's in Pleasant Grove or uh, American Fork. Uh, anyway, he'll, uh, he literally wrote the book on the beginner's guide to DXing. And so we'll talk a little bit about that today as well. So I'll go ahead and get to the next slide here. Um, why should we chase DX? I, I know it's, um, it's kind of a hobby within a hobby. You know, we all have these aspects of the, of the amateur radio hobby that we enjoy doing, whether it be, you know, emergency service, whether it be VHF, UHF with satellites or with, uh, with repeaters. Um, some people are into, you know, earth, moon, earth, moon bounce. Um, you know, this is an area, though, if you have an HF rig that really anyone can start dabbling in and having a lot of fun with. So um, one, one important thing that uh, everybody likes to do, of course, is chase the DX Century Club Award. I have up here a K7UA. Again, Bryce will speak to us soon. I have his uh, DX Century Club certificate. As you see here, he has over 345 entities confirmed and uh, he's on the DXCC honor roll. So what are entities? Well, an entity, when you're chasing DX, if you can confirm contact with an entity, you can mark up another one on your listing. An entity in effect is a sovereign nation or a far-flung territory. That's generally the way it works. So for example, in the United States, we have a number of entities, Alaska, Hawaii, they're both entities, Guam, Northern Mariana Islands, American Samoa, Puerto Rico, and so on. Um, so if it's a far-flung territory, it's likely on the DXCC list. So that's why, although there are only maybe 140-ish sovereign nations, there are, um, you know, well over 300 uh, or 40 um, entities. It's kind of fun because as you go tuning the dial and you, and you contact people, there's sort of this, uh, the thrill of the hunt as you uh, are able to get some of these more rare ones. What I also like about it is it's, an, it's, a, it's allowed me to improve my operating skills tremendously. I'm much better at being able to pick out 
uh, call signs and information out of the noise, out of the static. And of course, my CW skills have, uh, have been improved a lot since I've been on this journey. You also meet really great, interesting people worldwide. When I spoke to the club, I don't know, two and a half years ago, it was about, you may recall some of you, the benefits of upgrading, why it's good to get your general, your extra. And at that point, I talked a little bit about a test on DXing. And I, I mentioned how um, over the years, I've met some very interesting people. And as my wife and I have traveled, uh, it's fun to go through the log, look these people up, tell them you're going to be in the area. And you always have a nice, warm, uh, welcome red carpet laid out. And of course, you get a chance to operate from there too, which is a lot of fun. Um, and then um, getting these QSL cards is just a lot of fun. You know, here's one from the Galapagos Island. You know, here's one from Tomotu Province, way out in the far-flung Pacific. Uh, you know, here's one from St. Helena, which is a, a UK territory, right smack in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And when you're into the hobby doing DXing, it's really great because you can request for these QSL cards. They come back and uh, it's always fun to, to see what's in, the, what's in the mailbox. So um, now is, the, is a great time, guys, to be getting involved with DXing because we're just getting started with Solar Cycle 25. I'm sure many of you have uh, seen, like in QST Magazine and others, a lot of talk about you know this uh, solar cycle is now getting started. Um, Noji also had a nice um, discussion about this in the November 2018 uh, UVARC Shack newsletter. I highly encourage you to look that up and read it. If you Google it, you can find it. But as you see, you know, we're, you know, 2021 here, the sunspots are starting to come. Today, I can't talk about propagation but I'm near enough time. That could be an entire uh, presentation by somebody else, not me. I'm not a propagation expert. But it's really a great time for you to jump in now, uh, get your HF gear set up and start uh, logging the DXCC because as we get toward the peak of the sunspot cycle, which is forecasted to be in July of 2025, at that point, all the HF bands are gonna be wide open. 10 meters will be open 24 hours a day. You can work the world on five watts. So now's the time to hone your skills while we're getting on the upswing of this cycle. So you're probably thinking, well, yeah, I don't really have the equipment to be DXing, right? <laughs> what you see here is a contest station with you know stacked monoband Yaggies. Um, you don't really need that sort of thing to en enjoy DXing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is my antenna here in Saratoga Springs. Um, because my HOA does not allow um, exterior antennas other than like a satellite disc for TV reception, um, I opted to get a 24 foot flagpole vertical. I actually ordered this from zero five antennas, but they're not that hard to make. Um, it basically is a nine to one on, on and I've got, you know, the vertical element here and I've got 33 radials under the sod. So before we built the house, I made sure that all the conduit was there from here. I'm sorry, from here out to my shack uh, for the coax. Um, I made sure all my radials were down and then we put the sod over the top and it's worked really well. So back in 2015, I decided I'm gonna get serious about DXing. I joined the Utah uh, DX Association and there's some great mentors there, especially Bryce who will be speaking to us soon. Um, and they really kind of got me started with what I needed to do, what kind of gear I might wanna look at getting, um, how I can get my CW skills back up again. And I decided at that point, I thought, you know, I wonder how fast I can get to DXCC. So I made it a challenge just to make a sprint as fast as I could to get 100, 100 uh, confirmations either in the mail or electronically. We'll talk about that in a minute um, and get that on the wall within as quick as I could. So this is, this is my DXCC certificate. As you see, you can get endorsements. I have the 200 one here. Um, you can also get like DXCC like on CW, do you see that? And they have another one for digital. So if you're into FT8, which I'm starting to really enjoy, uh, and other digital modes, you can go for your DXCC digital only. You can also get DXCC by band. And um, anyway, so I decided to do it in 152 days, just with 100 watts, I was able to do it. So you can too, if you get serious about it. Now in 2015, we're kind of coming off the top of solar cycle 24. So there are quite a few good sunspot numbers at the time. And that helped me quite a bit. 
All right, next. Um, let's talk about antennas. Uh, it is the most important thing to consider if you want to get into DXing, okay? Some people have the mistaken impression that, hey, I can just put up a real modest antenna and that's fine, but so long as I put a kilowatt through there, I'm gonna be fine, I'm gonna go get an amp. You're much better off spending your time and resources at getting a better HF antenna up than you are spending money on amplifiers and really fancy HF transceivers. So generally the bigger is better, but hey, wire dipoles are fine. I met a guy once that uh, he has a wire dipole up in his living room, okay, inside his house, and he has over 150 DXCC. So he's having a great time with it. Um, of course, if you can you know, keep it resonant, you're gonna get much better throughput. You're gonna be able to hear better. Um, my, my flagpole, of course, is not resonant, resonant on all the bands. It's quite resonant on 30 meters being 24 feet but it's completely mismatched on all the other bands. And so I use a, a, you know, a, a tuner to be able to do that. So you know, if I'm putting out hundred Watts through the tuner on some of those bands, I may only be, you know, the effective radiated power may only be 10 or 20 Watts, but hey, that's okay. When the band is open, uh, you can usually make those contacts. Um, let's see here. Let's talk about just kind of basic wire antennas. Um, we're all quite familiar with that. When you got your license, uh, you probably had to study up a little bit about uh, antennas and how to cut them to a resonant, uh, resonant uh, length. They radiate very well broadside. Um, you can often put them up in HOAs where you know you have a, a very thin black wire going from maybe a this. The, for example, here I have an example of a of a, an N-fed antenna. Those work pretty well in HOAs. <clears throat> I use a vertical. Um, verticals, we kind of have, we like to joke that they, uh, they radiate per poorly in all directions. <laughs> but the vertical, vertical is a very good DX antenna. Why? Because it has a low uh, takeoff angle, which is great to get the, the long propagation off the ionosphere. I'm going to kind of go through these quickly because I don't, we only have uh, you know, 40 minutes, including question and answer. So um, ideally you would put up a directional antenna um, and you don't have to spend an arm and a leg on these as well. Ryan will, will go into probably a little bit of the economics of what, what he went through to put his, up his directional antenna recently. But if you can get a, a Yagi or even just like one of these more sim simpler uh, hex beam designs, multi multi multiple band, um, that's great because you can, uh, you can then, not only is your transmitted signal more powerful in the direction that it's headed, but you also knock out some of the receive signals that you don't want to hear, right? You're trying to hear the DX. You don't want to hear everybody else calling them. And so that's where a directional antenna is quite useful. Uh, and then finally, let's talk about transceivers. Um, you know, you can start with um, or or you can, you can go out and spend thousands. But generally speaking, if you can get a relatively new transceiver, it will already have a sound card built in for FT8. And we'll talk about FT8 in a moment. Other equipment you may need, um, if, you, if your rig does not have a sound card built in, in other words, a USB port to connect to your computer, um, you can buy these little signal link boxes for a hundred bucks. In fact, on eBay, they're considerably less used. As more and more amateurs uh, upgrade to the newest equipment, those are be, those are becoming quite uh, quite available on eBay and so on. Um, you know, you're going to need a logging software. Most of the best ones are free. Um, again, I can't go into all the detail, just given the limited time. Um, I highly encourage you to learn how to how to run CW Morse code. Um, and there's uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But again, wait on the amplifier. Just have fun with 100 watts and on FT8, maybe even 10, 15, up to 40 watts or so is all you're gonna need for many, uh, for many contexts. So next what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go through about five steps that I recommend that you consider doing if you wanna get into DXing. And the first step, first and foremost, is get yourself educated on this aspect of the hobby. And fortunately for us, um, our very own uh, K7UA Bryce Anderson has written a phenomenal guide. It's completely free. Um, it's a PDF that you can download. 
And uh, it's now in its third edition. And with that, I'm going to mute my mic. And Bryce, do you want to go ahead and take it away for a minute? Bryce, are you with us there? Uh, Bryce, you're muted. Unmute. There okay. You go. Okay. There we go. I'll go back. Oh, to thanks, here. John. Yeah. Well, like John said, uh, I'm an honor roll level DXer. It's pretty much the only thing I do in ham radio now. I've done lots of other things, but this is what interests me. Be scared off if you can't afford a lot of money for this or you can't put up much of an antenna. Any HF rig will get you going. I don't recommend starting out with a 5 watt radio. That's, uh, that's for experts. But with FT8 now, it's a, a new gateway for uh, new DXers to get into the hobby, and you don't really need a lot of power or a great antenna. <clears throat> I have both, but uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm very competitive at it. You don't need to be. The question is, what is DX? I was looking over my old box when I got started as a novice in 1961, and I wrote down best DX so far, and it was a station in Idaho. So it's all relative. I don't talk to anyone in North America hardly anymore, but uh, uh, if you would like to know more about this, just get my book. It's at k7ua.com. It's absolutely free. I spent a lot of time on it. I think it covers almost everything you need to know to get going other than, well, you need to know enough to, to be able to make a, a contact on HF in whatever mode that you prefer. Past that, I think it'll teach you what to do. Appreciate uh, John giving me the uh, time to talk about it. Uh, one of the things I have enjoyed most about DX is I've got lifelong friends from it, people in other countries that I'll never meet, but to recognize my call letter. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just really fun to know people in other lands. I wrote this book. I was the DX club president about 10 years ago. It started out as a series of uh, articles. I'd write one a month. And the reason was I'd see new faces come into our club, and in a year or two, they would be gone. They found that maybe it didn't fit some of them, but I think we were failing a lot of them because we were giving them no education. That's the whole point of this. It's not written for experts. If you're anywhere uh, near an expert, you'll be ridiculing it, saying it's too simple. And it is if you're that level, but uh, if you're not, I think there's a lot of good information in there on on pretty much everything you need to know. So uh, yeah. with that, I'll turn it back to John. Thank you, Bryce. And again, it's what maybe 40-ish pages, something like that. It's a pretty easy read, right? It's it's up to 60 something now. It's it's grown. The last one I put in a lot of illustrations for FT8, but it is an easy read. A lot of the pages are just illustrations. They're all my own. So uh, it's uh, it's meant to be simple. This is not some highly technical manual for engineers only. <laughs> Great. Yeah, so again, k7ua.com. I would encourage anybody who's interested in getting started in DXing to first and foremost read up on that. And then, hey, get your feet wet, right? Um, I know in this club, uh, we have quite a few technician class operators, um, but you know, that's okay. As you see here, um, you do have privileges on 10 meters, uh, up to 200 watts. Um, and the FT8 area is right here, 28.074, I believe. Anyway, you'll find it in the software. You can run FT8 here. You can run sideband from 300 to 500. And, uh, you know, the bands are starting to open up quite a bit now as the sunspot cycle is uh, taking off with cycle 25. I'm finding lots of openings on 10 meters. Uh, we call it these uh, cross equatorial band openings. I even, I, we were seeing that, Bryce, you probably did too, right? During the 10 meter contests, um, you know, to South America, Central America, uh, quite a few openings, even when there are no sunspots. There's it's really good. weird things that happened on 10. I was working on getting my five band DXCC, the last minimum, and at midnight, the solar minimum, I worked uh, Hong Kong. Midnight, midnight, our time, there should have been no way that anything was on. Weird stuff happens. 
And uh, 10 Meters is a great band. It is coming into its own, and now it's the cycle improves, and you technicians have got a, a great band. You do. Absolutely. And six meters too. Magic band, they call it sometimes, because when it opens, it feels like magic. <laughs> so take a look at that as well. Um, learn how to set up FT8. We don't have time today to talk about it. That could actually be an entirely separate uh, evening uh, discussion about the WSJT software that includes FT8. I'm going to touch on it just in a moment here. You should set up a logbook of the world account. I encourage that for all amateurs, okay? You, uh, ARL has a process for you to get your logbook of the world account. And what that is, it's a logbook matching service. So you can upload your logs to the logbook of the world and everybody around the world does that. There are just tens of millions of contacts in this global database. And then ARRL will match your contacts. And so if you're matched, then um, you can use that match for award credit. And then, um, like I mentioned earlier, just start looking at logging softwares. Most of them are free. You can get on YouTube, learn about different logging software, how people enjoy them, that sort of thing. Um, I use a Mac, uh, so I recommend Rumlog. It's by a, a guy in Germany. It's completely free. But anyway, if you have questions, feel free to ask me or Bryce. Um, or anyone else who's into DXing about logging software. There's some really good ones out there. So this is just a little detour I'm gonna take about FT8. I imagine many of you already are using FT8 if you're, if you're running HF. There are a few things that I just wanted to point out, okay? Um, one of the most common problem people have in setting up the WSJT software that has FT8 in it is figuring out how to get that USB cable between the PC and the rig and making that sound card work. Uh, YouTube is going to be your friend there. Um, if you can't get that to work, you won't be able to do any digital modes. Another thing that I see out of the box, so to speak, when you download it, this whole TX frequency is not checked. Please check that box. Otherwise, what happens is when you answer somebody, you're going to move your frequency over to them and you're going to be right on top of them. After you're done with that QSO, you're going to be competing with them for that well, we'd say that portion of the, uh, of the pass band, okay? Check the TX frequency. Another problem is uh, clocks can go, the FT8 is all about synchronizing every 15 seconds. Make sure your clock is accurate. Um, I use a Mac and it's just always accurate, but for PCs, there are uh, softwares that you can use to, to make sure that's in sync. Another thing is RF in the shack. Um, you know, these USB cables, if, they, if they're picking up some of the RF, especially if you've if you got a high SWR coming back down the coax, um, you want to ferrite everything. And then another problem we see is overmodulation. To see this example here, um, you, know, don't be a, you know, don't make everybody mad at you. Make sure that you're careful not to overmodulate your signal. Okay, we're going to go to the next step here. Um, the next step, of course, is you're going to need to upgrade if you don't already have your general, and especially extra is great. Most DX hangs out on that part of the bands. Um, and it's nice because on SSB, there's typically something open at any given time, lower bands in the evening, higher bands during the day. Um, it's an opportunity to make some good friends with SSB. And then I, I just love CW. It's a great mode. It's very satisfying to work contacts on CW. And um, I recommend the CW Academy. It's online and it's free. There are many tools out there to learn how to uh, learn what's, what bands are propagating to what areas. I've listed a few here. And I believe we'll be able to post these slides online. You can look at these later. Next, let's talk about how to find the DX. I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to share another, I'm going to actually share my browser here real quick. Uh, I'll just go over to this desktop here, share. Oh, wrong desktop. I need to share the other desktop. Sorry, guys. Share screen. There we go. There we go. I'll just use it. All right, so there are a number of tools that, uh, that you can use to find out, okay, well, who's on right now and can I work them? One of my favorites is dxheat.com. Um, with this, you can choose what you want to look for, okay? And a spot is it's just like spotting elk or something, right? A spot is when somebody puts onto this global network of spotting clusters 
hey, I'm hearing this station right now on this frequency. And that's all automated with FT8 as well. But for example, here's somebody in Azerbaijan. He's on 30 meter FT8. And a guy in the third call district. So it's, it's propagating to the East Coast right now. Does that make sense? So if I got on, I might be able to hear him. Azerbaijan isn't one that I need, but if it was, I would be jumping on it. Here's my friend 3D2AG, okay? This is uh, Antoine. Uh, he and I have uh, met each other a number of occasions. He's in Fiji, he's very active. He and I went to the little island of Tuvalu together uh, a couple of years ago. So it looks like, uh, looks like Antoine is on right now on uh, 30 meter FT8. I might be able to work him, does that make sense? And so this is kind of cool because I can say, look, um, I want spots coming from North America only, and I want only these DX areas. Does that make sense? You can kind of filter what it is that you want to uh, find. Another great website is dxworld.net. This will tell you which rare entities are going to be activated, right? So here's, a, here's an article about someone in St. Helena. You know, he's heading there soon to be working as a doctor between June and September. So, okay. I want to take a listen if I need St. Helena, maybe put that on my calendar. That's a good one. QST Magazine has a column, How's DX? I hope all of you take a QST Magazine. You're all members of the league. This is usually about a month delay just due to the, to the press time. But the fellow who writes this, Bernie W3UR, also has a newsletter that you can subscribe, subscribe to and get more timely information. So with that, I'll go back to the presentation. There we go. Let's see here. Right there. Okay. We talked about that. And then there's another nice software, nice website called Club Log. With Club Log, you can load your club, your, your logbook, just like Logbook to the World, you can load your logs to Club Log. And by the way, most logging software will do this automatically for you once you have it set up. And then it'll tell you how you're coming on your DXCC um, award, you know, which entities you still need to confirm and so on. And then there's a, then of course, to get these QSL cards, you need to, you know, you, some of them are not on Logbook of the World. Many DX are not there, so you need to send out your cards. With that, I'm gonna turn the time over to Ryan because he's just been through all of this. And Ryan, I'm going to share this uh, these slides that you sent over to me. So if you'll unmute, you can take it away. Okay. Are you going to do I advance them, or are you going to do that? I'll advance them. Just say next. Okay. All right then. Hey, it's a it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the for for the invitation. It uh, I just want to also give a plug out for uh, uh, John and Bryce who are who just presented. These these gentlemen know so much about DXing. Um, I, I've especially benefited uh, from John when, you know, when I first got into the Utah DX Club. He really helped me to, to set myself up when I was a technician on FTA, and I, I did so well, and he, he pushed me and challenged me, and it was, it was a great experience for me. So uh, with that, uh, I was so uh, surprised and, and thought it was so neat that there are so many technicians. What, what was it, Noji? It was like 15, 20 new technicians in your, in your club. Is that what it is? Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. I, I, I encourage you just keep going, pull out that book, get back on that uh, 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 and get your general done. If you feel really ambitious, go all the way up to extra. I mean, get, get it done. It is so much fun being up in the HF bands. Let's see here. Can you see the slide? Oh yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It, it's not mine though. Is that not yours? No. Oh, okay. But it's a good one though. I could probably. <laughs> well, let me try anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm November 7 Delta Whiskey Whiskey and I'm up here. My QTH or my home is up here in uh, Riverton, uh, Riverton, Utah. It's uh, the, the Celestial Kingdom uh, County of Salt Lake City. And so. Oh, Can you see that now, Ryan? No, it's not. Do you want me just to share mine? Yeah. Oh, go back, go back, go back. Did that work? Go back a little bit on the All right. slides. All right, here we go. I'll, I'll try this again. Sorry, guys. <laughs> How about that? 
Oh, okay. Yeah, perfect. Sounds good. Um, so in 2013, I actually got my technician license way back then. And I worked a lot of the repeaters. I worked a lot of the, you know, local stuff that they did, you know, line of sight. I had some fun in stuff, but it but wasn't quite what I was looking for, for a full-time hobby and stuff like that. So I kind of got out of it and just kind of let it lapse. And uh, I didn't really worry about it that much. And then uh, when COVID hit back in 2020, I thought, man, I, I wonder what's going on out there. And I wonder, you know, because uh, cause, you know, I had a little bit of experience with HF through a friend back when I had my technician license. I remember him talking with some foreign countries and stuff. And so I borrowed a radio. I borrowed an HF radio from another friend. And I threw up a, a dipole that he had lent me. And I started listening. And, uh, and the dipole wasn't the best um, uh, for, for listening to DX stations, but it was really good for listening to people in the United States that were talking to, to DX stations. So I can only really hear one side of it. I got really excited. I got really excited about people commenting about, uh, uh, you know, responding back to what was going on in Europe or Asia or, or, or wherever, uh, during COVID. And they were, uh, oh, you got that, John? Yeah, yeah. There we go. Okay. And, and, and so I got really excited about it again during COVID for the uh, trying to, to go from technician to general. But as soon as uh, COVID hit, I go ahead and go to the next one, John. Okay. Okay. Go to the next one. Yeah. There we go. But as soon as uh, uh, COVID hit, all the testing to advance to the next two go general or extra were all shut down this is back in you know march april so it all shut down so i didn't have the opportunity to test and so of course john uh mentioned kk7l he encouraged me okay you're a technician get on 10 meters he helped me get on ft8 and i was making through ft8 i was making some contacts in south america you know canada central america mexico things like that. And then on a single, single sideband on 10 meters, I was making contacts like Mexico, Southern Canada, uh, Central America, and of course, all over the United States. And it was so much fun when 10 meters was open. It's definitely a, a tough band because I'd go a week or two with nothing that also I could, I could get a hold of some people. So that was fun to do while, while I was waiting. Uh, next one, John. So finally, I was among some of the first, I think 50 people that when they started offering online testing, I was one of the first, I think, I think I was like 50 or 60th in line. And I actually was able to get my general license with online testing. That was really fun. It, it was neat going through that and everybody was still developing it and stuff like that. And, and so it was a lot of fun to do that. Uh, next, John. Uh, my, my goal after I got my general license was then I want, you know, after hearing all the stuff going on with COVID, all these countries talking to each other stuff, I thought, well, I want to build a DX station, a station I could hear everybody around the world and be able to talk to them. And I also had a real interest in contesting. So I thought, wow, I'm listening to these people. They're having so much fun. And it is, it's a, it's a hoot. I thought I want to do that too. So I wanted, so my goal then after I got my general was to build a contesting and a DX station. Uh, next one, John. So what, when I first started uh, uh, pricing out the cost of building a DX station, contesting station, I was overwhelmed. It was in the thousands and thousands of dollars. And I was overwhelmed. And I, was, and I was, uh, it got to the point where I probably wasn't able to do it. Maybe I'm going to lose some interest. I won't be able to do what I want to do. So then I started getting on KSL. And I found, and this is for those who maybe you think this might be really expensive and it is a really expensive hobby. But what I found was I was able to get on KSL and I found deals that I didn't know were even out there. Uh, one of them, one of them was there was a silent key family who was selling all his stuff. And, and, and so I rushed to go see if I could get a discount on something, but everybody had, but there are several groups that had gotten there before me and they took the rate, they bought the radios and the amps and the, and all this stuff. And so I, and so I, I left the, my name and number with the son-in-law who was kind of running that for the family that sell. And, and I, I left, I couldn't, you know, every, everything was gone. Then he calls me a couple of weeks later and says, you know, Ryan, nobody wanted this tower or all this coax cable or this HF beam, which was huge and all these UHF, VHF uh, uh, antennas and these inverted V dipoles. He said, if you come and take it down and haul it away, you can have it for free. And so I was able to get, I got a free 40 foot Roan tower. I got a big, huge beam 
a HF beam. I got a rotator to rotate the beam. I got so much coax and stuff like that. So I kind of lucked out in there, didn't spend any money. It just cost me a couple of pizzas and bribing some friends to come and <laughs> help me take it down. Uh, another one was that there was another uh, tower on KSL for, I think it was 400 bucks. And it was a, a 60 foot tower. And I thought, well, I already got a tower. That's a lot of money. And and finally, after two months of it being on there, I called the guy and he said, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, if you come get this 60 foot tower, I'll sell it to you for half the price. And so I went over there and I grabbed it. And when I was over there and talking with him, he finally just went into his house and he handed me more coax. He handed me a ro another rotator and he handed me some other stuff because he was moving. He retired and they were moving out of state. So I got all this stuff for around $200. And, the, you know, another and the list goes on. I got another beam antenna for half of what he originally wanted for and another rotator and and some more coax and it's just and, and i found that if uh, on on ksl especially uh if you go on there, there there's a lot of deals there's a lot of things happening if you're really talking with people the cost of building uh contesting or dx station cannot it might not be as expensive as you as you think especially if you're willing to put some elbow grease in it and go out there and do some labor <coughs> or stuff like that you can get some of this stuff for pretty cheap. And so I, I was excited about that. The only thing that I bought brand new is I bought a, my radio. I bought, my, I bought an ICOM 7300 radio. And that was the only thing I bought new. Everything else, my, my beam antennas are probably 20, 30 years old. And, and the towers are probably about the same. You know, they're, they're, they're super old and stuff. But it's good equipment. It worked well. And, and uh, John, next slide. It, it worked well, and I was really excited to, to have that. Okay, so I ended up with, with all these tower <coughs> tower links. I ended up building two towers or setting up two towers. I set up a 35-foot tower with guy wires, and that was my – and I put a big beam uh -huh. antenna on it with a rotator, and I was and I was starting to make contacts across the, the water, and, you know, in different continents and stuff. And then I also set up, I had another beam at a second beam that I wanted to, to tune up. So I put a little teeny tiny uh, uh, and uh, tower right next to my deck. And I put that other beam up there. And I started to kind of tune it and, and stuff like that. And, and uh, I was so excited about DX and I was ready to start <coughs> testing and I was ready to roll. But as Murphy would have it, John, next slide. A ginormous uh, storm came, huge winds, and blew a tree over. And this tree went through my guy wire of my big 35-foot antenna and, and pulled it down. As you can see there uh, on top of that tree, you can see that Rhone Tower there laying upside of it. And then to the right of that, you can see my beam over there that I took off the tower. And I, you know, uh, it was all messed up and bent. I was trying to, trying to fix it. And it's, so that was quite a, uh, discouraging. So John, next slide. And then also on my small tower I had, the tree also went and bent one side of it, kind of bent <laughs> down as you can see. But I kind of lucked out on that one because it, only, because it only bent the tips of it. And so I was able to fix that with just in a week or two. Also, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a, a green line that goes from the bottom right up to the tree. And that was my 40 meter, uh, 15 meter inverted V. So in a matter of one uh, windstorm and one tree, it took out all my bands. I, I didn't have uh, any radio bands at all to do. So that, that was quite an, an exciting time to be able to do that. Of, of course, I contacted the Utah DX Association, the club I was in. I said, hey, I need some help here. But but during COVID, all they did was laugh at me and, and told me good luck. So I, I was on my own on this one. But it was it was a lot of fun. Ham radio can be a lot of fun. It is exciting, it's energetic, and it, it is so rewarding. Uh, next slide. So I want to talk about, and John talked about QSL cards. I want to talk about that a little bit. Those are those are a lot of fun. I I'm enjoying that. I I and John explained what it was. Is just a person confirming through the mail, through the the, the, the snail mail that they made a contact with you and then vice versa, you send one back to them also confirming that, that, that contact. Uh, next slide, John. And so these are, so this, this QSL card on the left, that was my first call sign. When I first got my, my, uh, my general. And so I made a bunch of cards up with that. And I, I did, uh, I sent a bunch of those out, had a lot of fun. But when I started doing DXing and contesting, 
I found out that some of the, uh, like, you know, Kilo, Golf 7, Foxtrot, Romeo, Sierra, they, the, 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 the phonetics of some of those letters were not being heard as well. So I changed it. And that's my new QSL card on the right is November 7, Delta, Whiskey, Whiskey. And I found it with doing a little bit of research and asking around that W or whiskey, whiskey, whiskey is really heard well when you're DXing, you're talking or, or when you're contesting and there's a big pile up of people, uh, the person uh, receiving the calls will, will frequently go a whiskey. Is there a whiskey out there? A whiskey, whiskey. So I found that I was being heard better by adding uh, W's or whiskey, whiskeys in my call sign. So now I'm, I'm November 7, Delta whiskey, whiskey. Uh, next slide. And I, I didn't do a very good job in scanning these, so I, I apologize. But these are some QSL cards that I've gotten in the mail. I, I right now, I think I have about maybe 30, 35 DX QSL cards. And, and like John said, it is so much fun to run out there and, and see if you got something in the mail. You know, you, you send out 20, 30 cards and, and, and it's exciting to kind of to kind of get them back. Uh, this one right here, the top one, oh, go back one, John. Uh, uh, the top one there is Mexico. Bottom one is Guatemala. Guatemala. Next one. Uh, uh, I got Russia. The top one is Russia. You know, the uh, bottom one is Japan. I tell you, Japan from Utah is so easy to get. There's, it is so much fun talking to the ham radio operators in, uh, in Japan. And, and John, if I'm not mistaken, isn't John is in a, a Japan one of the more has the most uh, ham radio operators? Is that is that true? Yeah, there are more operators in Japan than any other country. It's a very popular hobby there. It it is, and and whether you're on digital modes, FT8, or if you're on CW, or if you're on phone, there's always so many people to talk to in in Japan. So many people to talk to. Uh, next slide. So yeah, that that one is from trying uh, Hungary. Top ones from Hungary. Uh, the bottom one is from the St. Lucia, St. Lucia Island. You've worked this one on 10 meters when you're a technician. He was very active. Yeah, yeah. Six I, months ago. I got that one on 10 and I got him on 20. Yeah, he was very yeah. active. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that was a good one. Uh, uh, next one here, uh, Argentina, and then uh, Bulgaria, I think is the other one. Yep, and then Bulgaria. Yeah, yeah. you did pretty well. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I've done pretty good. So, I, you know, like I said, on on uh, uh, John talked about the award, uh, the DXCC award. And, and <laughs> it's what? This is so, only, I mean, Bryce has like, what do you say, Bryce, like 5,000 of these. We're running low on time, by the way. I have 8,000. I, I need to make one comment. I saw someone saying they were bringing out my book. Probably a third of the content is in the links. So uh, they don't work very well from a print. <laughs> but I'm going to share just two more quick slides here, and then we'll wrap it up and, uh, and take some questions. So the final step um, is you got to apply for the award. And Bryce details that in his book, how to go about doing that. You essentially take your logbook of the world contacts. Um, you, you apply that toward DXCC. And then um, if you have QSL cards, you take them to a card checker. In Utah, we have three of them here, K7UT, W7CT, N5LZ. That's in basically uh, Riverton, uh, Davis County, and uh, up in uh, Cache County. And then um, just uh, want to, again, remind everyone that there is a Utah DX Association. We've been around for half a century. We have monthly meetings, usually the third Wednesday of the month. There is a small fee. But we like to plow a lot of those fees towards supporting expeditions and other club activities. A couple other little resources, then I'll, uh, I'll call it quits here and go for questions. Uh, we talked about how's DX. Oh, actually, we went through this as, as well. So, hey, good luck, good DXing, and we will take questions. I have a question for Bryce. Hello, Don. Hi, Bryce. How you doing? I'm Let's well. <laughs> good. Listen, uh, I'm just curious, uh, having known you for a long time and know where you lived and everything, can you address the issue of, of uh, terrain around you? As you know, I live right up at the base of Mount Timpanogos, and there seems to be a big blank area on the world where I can't get to. Did you experience that when you lived over here, and is that why you moved out in the flats here? 
I don't live in the flesh. I'm in the best location I've been in. I'm in the north side of American Fork. I grew up in Pleasant Grove. Don and I were about a block apart. Uh, I moved to Linden, and I was even closer to the foothills. I moved to North Orem, which was almost as bad. And I'm in uh, North American Fork. I have a better view towards the north than I did for many of those other locations. And if you look at my book, uh, almost all of the world is between due east and due west of us. All of population is towards the north, you know, other than South America and the Caribbean and the Pacific, but they're easy to get. The hard stuff to get is north of us. So uh, being right against the mountain is, well, of course it matters. It matters a lot. Sorry. <laughs> okay. You a comment that, and a question? That, thank you, Bryce. I appreciate that comment. It's good to see you again. I got a comment and a question for John. Go ahead, Carl. Uh, a, a couple of things. One, I want, the comment I want to make is uh, I found uh, I had a lot of luck. I sent $20 to the Bureau, and it seemed like every few months I get uh, QSL cards from places from several years go ago even. And so the Bureau might be a good resource for uh, sending a $20 bill and always having some postage there that could be used to have QSL cards sent from people. That's all they use somewhere uh, sometimes. Uh, overseas is the Bureau. That's correct. And um, the Bureau is a, is a really inexpensive way to get QSL shipped around the world, but it takes can take years. Outgoing, yeah. you send them to ARRL in Newington, Connecticut. You need to be a member of the league. And they, they have on their website how to do the outgoing QSLs. And the incoming in our call district, the seventh call district is the Willamette Valley Radio Club in Oregon. But again, that's on the ARRL website. You can learn how to do that. Yeah, it is kind of fun when those bureau cards come in. It just, oh, wow, I remember that contact three years ago. Oh, yeah, that was the best $20 bill I ever put out there. Um, my fun. question is, uh, somehow, well, I don't know how I didn't stay on top of it, but my, I let my uh, logbook of the world lapse. Is there an easy way to recover uh, from that, or do you have to start all over again on logbook of the world? Um, I would call the league and ask them how to do that. Um, I should imagine you could just go ahead and, and reapply. And then once you've reapplied, they'll send you that postcard to confirm that you're, you really are you. Um, you can probably just upload your log again. And it's kind of fun. When I got, remember that sprint I talked about in 153 days, I got VXCC. The first 20 or so of those came off of uh, this old dusty log book of mine. Remember these? <laughs> I, I went through here and I looked for contacts that, oh, hey, there's a DXCC I'm going to need. I'm going to need that. And I just put those in my logging software. I didn't type everything in there. And then it was crazy. I had contacts come back off logbooks over a decade since I worked them. It's kind of cool. Who's ready to do some DXing? Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Oh yeah, we're ready to do it. Excellent, John. Let's, let's hear any, anybody else have questions and comments for John at all? I guess I have a question. Go ahead, Eric. Um, the question I have is, uh, I want to focus mo two things. Uh, single sideband is what I want to focus on. And hopefully, you know, before too long, I'll be on. Um, but two things. I, I speak Spanish uh, natively, and I'm interested in uh, contacts in Central and South America. Uh, I'd like to probably focus on that those areas first. Uh, how hard um, is that? Is there specific bands that are used more commonly and what tips would you have for me? Great question. Let me first say that I speak Japanese from a uh, mission experience and 17 meters of the 18 megahertz band around this time of day before sunset is like a straight, you know, S9 copy on single side band in Japan. And I've had so much fun talking to the Japanese over there. In fact, I know I mentioned this the other day on our net. Uh, I, I, you know, one of the Japanese, they always ask, well, how did you learn Japanese? It is kind of an unusual language. 
And so I served as a, as a missionary and he came back, oh, and he said, oh, where did you serve? I served in the Nagoya mission. I'm like, going, oh, you must be Latter-day Saint. That was kind of cool to, to meet a, a fellow, somebody of my religion that lives over there. But to answer your question specifically, the easiest thing for you to do is to erect a dipole antenna broadside uh, towards South America. So you would, you would orient it uh, east to west, essentially. Uh, take a look at the great circle bearing, you know, map like that. And then, um, yeah, even, I don't know if, are you technician class? You could, you could try 10 meters, um, look on the spots, uh, see when a spot comes up for South America, like that DX heat. There's another mm -hmm. great little app called, uh, it's called Ham Alert. You can get for iPhone or Android, Ham Alert, jot that down, where you can send on there, hey, I want to know when this country is on this band and okay. then you'll get an alert. So yeah, I, I recently, yeah, appreciate it. I just wrote all that stuff down. Thank yeah. you. Recently in the last, uh, maybe like two months ago, got my my general. And so I, I've got a radio and um, Noji's been amazing to try to help me get my myself situated and uh, hopefully we'll be up and going before too soon. Too yeah, long. Central South yeah. America is a walk in the park. On is that okay? Meters, 20 meters, eight, uh, 17 meters. No problem. Uh, this time of day is great, actually. In the 20 meters, 17. And what else did you say? I'm sorry. Uh, just the higher bands. 20, okay. 20 uh, 17, 15 meters is, is often open to South America. Occasionally okay. 10 meters for those technicians that want to give it a whirl. Uh, Ryan, you work some South America when you're still a technician, right? Yes. Yeah, they'll, they'll every once in a while be on 10 meters. But I think Eric said he's a general now, so I think he'd be able to do and and eric i i don't have an amp i'm just i'm just using 100 watts and I'm, I'm getting contacts you know quite a you know all over the world and so uh but okay. when, I first, when i first started i did kind of what john was saying i had a dipole you know uh, you know 20 you know 20 meter 40 meter you know dipole i just put it like like john was saying east to west and then and then and then i experimented and did the inverted v and i'd put the legs down you know north and south you know, so I was balanced a little bit. So it, it, it's fun. You can do it with a hundred watts. You could do South America. It'd be a lot of fun for you. Awesome. And I guess the last question I have, and this is just out of curiosity, because um, I was supposed to go there last December, but COVID changed all my plans. But any any one of you here on uh, on this uh, Zoom uh, contacted Easter Island? Oh, I never know. Oh yeah, Easter Island, um, there is only one ham that actually, a, a guy that is a resident ham there, he's not on very often, but you'll often see people go on sort of a DX holiday there. They'll go to Easter Island and they'll, you know, operate from their hotel for a few days. Um, so again, watch DX, uh, some of those websites to get a sense of when those will be opening up. Like DX awesome. World. Yeah, you Easter get, Island is a good one. The QS always come, the cards from there are always kind of fun because, of course, they have those those big statues typically. Yeah, the Moais. Yeah. Yeah. The so Moais, I, yeah, what I'm going to do uh, to give it just a little bit of background. My I, I was born in Chile. I speak Spanish. My family immigrated, but um, I'm going to try to see if I can contact some of the stations down there and see and talk to them via you know via internet to say, okay, what are you guys doing and when when's the best time to try to get a hold of you guys and and hopefully be able to work them by, by not just coincidence, but actually trying to see if we can contact each other. I don't know if that'll be successful or not, but I thought at least I talk to them and see, okay, what are you guys doing and where do you hang out and where generally do you, could, I, could I find you if I were looking for you, right? Let me tell you one of my most enjoyable ham radio related experiences. Um, 3D2MD, Monaco, tiny little country in Europe, right? on the French Riviera. Um, uh, my, my mentor had contacted her, Laura is her name, and they started corresponding back in the day after QSL cards, they started writing letters. We actually met up with him in Monaco with her and I got to work, use her station. It was real super cool. <laughs> yeah, wow. and so, you know, that's the nice thing about this hobby. You get to know people, just even making one contact now you can just email them. Hey, that was a really fun con. Hey, I'm going to be in Belgium, you know, next spring. Let's get together. Yeah. And, and generally people are very open to, to meeting with you. Like my friend in Fiji, you know, I've, I've met him many times on my trips to Australia. I'd go through the, my route 
will go through there um, for business. So yeah, it, combining international travel with DXing is a lot of fun. Oh, I'm, I'm excited. I'm telling you, you guys got me much more excited than I already was. Cool. You're going to be our Thank rookie of the year next year. <laughs> I, I hope I, I hope to have a lot of fun. That's for sure. I'm okay, looking. cool. And there's a question on YouTube asking how successful you have been using uh, SSB on six meters. That's a Bryce question. Aren't you uh, focusing on six meters right now, Bryce? Well, it's uh, it's pretty tough. I've got like eight countries on uh, six meters. It is not a DX or span in my opinion, unless you consider Texas. I think I've got about 1,000 contacts to Texas. <laughs> Here's a, this current house DX in the ARRL QSD actually talks about six meters. And look at this little graph here. The blue is FT8 contacts that have been logged. This is probably logbook of the world or club log. But look at SSB. That's this little sliver right here, the orange. So. Six meters is really not much of a SSB DXing band. I Good worked question. Japan and a few things like that, Alaska, but uh, that is not a place to put your emphasis. May, may I just add, if, if you're a female and you want to upgrade to your general or your extra let me tell you they are so popular on the hf bands if you hear a female voice everybody's doing it my my daughter got on uh, last field day and i i was trying to call out cq trying to drum up some stuff and she helped me a little bit and my heavens she created just this just an enormous amount of people trying to got trying to contact her and she got overwhelmed so she gave it back to me and then they all left after you know a few contacts and stuff. So if you're if you're a female, trust me, you you will do very very well in the HF bands. Some of the more rare entities, like when there's a D expedition where they mount them, they spend you know half a million dollars to go to some rare place, and of course everybody wants to contact them because everyone needs that rare entity. Uh, the female voices tend to cut through the crowd. I've been on the other side of that. They call it the pileup. Uh, when I traveled to that fairly rare country, I've been there a few times, Tuvalu. It's uh, north of Fiji, about a two-hour flight. But uh, man, when the, when, the, when the YLs would come on, I could, I could just pick them out of the pileup crowd immediately. So something about the, the higher pitch of the voice or something, I don't know. Yeah. We need more YLs in the hobby, right, guys? For sure. Yep. Wendy's nodding her head. <laughs> Oh, very good, very good. Well, thank you so much, John. Appreciate your time and and uh, Gary and Ryan for all your work that you've done and and time you took to share and everything. Thank you so much. You did a wonderful job again. Well, uh, thank you, Noji. Great club. Great, because of great guys like you. All right. Well, let's go ahead and move on. Thank you so much for this great presentation. I'm so glad we recorded it because. I want to go back and review a lot of the things you said, which is, I know, very helpful. And um, a lot of people can glean many great things from it. So thank you again. Well, let's, let's go ahead and uh, move on with the last part of our <coughs> meeting here. And that is with um, the, um, the um, door prizes. I'm going to check one more time. Tonight, Brent said he was not going to make it, so he's asked me to fill in for him. So Brent, are you on tonight at all yet? No, I don't. I don't see him on. And, all right. So it's, so you're stuck with me, guys. I'm, my apologies. All right. So in preparation, I've got all the door prize numbers here and the people and everything. And, and here's what's up for grabs. So as usual, we got our second prize is going to be a, a transceiver. Somewhere. Oh, TYT transceiver right here, um, dual band. Uh, very good. Um, dual, not exactly dual watch, but it's um, it's pretty handy. And um, the first prize will be the Pocris J pole, and that comes with installation. So there you go. Um, for um, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh prizes, we, a person 
once you get one of those, you get to choose between, uh, let's see, MacBook Pro power supply. If you don't have a MacBook Pro, then don't choose it. But there you go. <laughs> it's brand new in the box, never been opened. Um, also, we have the ARRL monthly or annual uh, membership. Um, let's see, and we also have um, a signal stick antenna. There we go from Richard. We have a pair of wire strippers. These are brand new. They've only been used once just to make sure it works. And they work. So, brand new pair of wire strippers. And let's see, I'll better put this over here. And then uh, let's see, what else is there? Oh, yeah. We got an ICOM grab bag. So in other words, we got a bag that has a bunch of ICOM things in it from the 2020 Ham Fest. I couldn't bring all the stuff with me here with um, that goes with that grab bag, but they include things like the, you know, there is a 2020 um, pen for the Ham Fest, a 2020 calendar. Um, so we got an ICOM water bottle with it. And last but not least, it actually comes with an ICOM <laughs> IC9700. Or, or a photo of it anyway on a mouse pad. At any rate, looks pretty sticky. So there you go. There you go, pen for the hand fist. And those are our prices. So the first five people that we select now gets to choose their prize among these five non-grand prizes. So here we go. Okay, first number is 3268 N7RTV clip. Yay! Clip, are you on? And, and okay. by the way, yeah, I, I hear you. Okay. okay. I was just going to say to Clip that um, you do not have to be present to win tonight since we're you know giving away the farm here, but you get, well, okay, the bad news, Clip, is you don't get the grand prize, but hey, good prizes. The good news is you get one of these fancy prizes. So I come grab bag, um, the single stick antenna, um, wire strippers, ARRL, MacBook Pro power supply. What's it going to be? Uh, did you say there was, there was a grab bag icon, grab bag or right. something? Yeah, right. I come grab bag, including an IC9700. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that. I'll go. All look. right. Very good. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Next one. Four nine one nine. Lynn Hancock, K seven LSH. Uh, they're on YouTube. Okay, Lynn is on YouTube, and Lynn, are, can he choose? Um, the they're a few chat. minutes behind, but okay. I can I can chat. Okay. All right, so Lynn gets to choose the next prize. <laughs> because and Lynn's on YouTube at the moment, so he's a little bit behind in our um, in our time format here. So give him just a couple minutes. Meanwhile, I'm going to go ahead and choose the next person, but they won't be able to choose the prize until Lynn does. So uh, let's roll it. And it is 6207. That's Eric Hansen, N9ERC. Eric. Hey. All right. All right. So once Lynn gets a chance to pick his prize, which is, by the way, no longer contains the ICOM 9700 photo. And um, now you get to choose what Lynn doesn't. Sounds good. Hang on. I think I have his. Need to tell those YouTubers to get on the radio. Lynn's uh, said ARL membership. Yeah. So what was left? So he wanted the ARL membership. So there's the antenna and the wire strippers left, and the MacBook Pro power supply. Yep. Is that a USB C power supply? Do you know? Um, Is it the later one or? No, it's a it's an AC. So so it plugs in the wall and it goes to the MacBook Pro on the other end. Yeah, so a lot of the newer MacBook Pros use USB C charging. So I wasn't yeah, sure yeah. if it was it was the Mac yeah. safe or not. Yeah, it's not a USB. It's a, okay. It's one of those slim line things that you, you put sideways. 
Uh, mm -hmm. what, what, what antenna is that? Sorry. If this is the signal sticks antenna. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've already got one of those. So yeah. Um, let's do the, let's do the, well, actually I could always use another signal stick. That's, they're always great. So I'll take the antenna. All right, Eric, you got the antenna. Let's see. By the way, I just want to mention too. Oh yeah. And so Eric, congratulations. Yay. Thank you. And I want to mention that everybody who has won door prizes in the past, but, but we have not delivered them to you, please let me know. You don't have to feel like a you know a grab or anything. I I'm happy to, to get these to you, but sometimes we lose a list of people we we um who have won these prizes. So please let me know and I'll be sure and and fulfill our duty to give you those um, prizes. So, yeah. Okay. Let's see. All right. So the next one. I'm just go ahead. So, so Cliff got the the wrap bag, right? Okay. All right, two more left, and that goes between the signal stick and the wire strippers. So here we are. Joyce, didn't he want the signal stick? Oh, I, 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 I took the signal stick. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So now we have the MacBook Pro um, power supply and the wire strippers. And if this is the only thing left, and you don't have a Mac, we'll have to figure something else. <laughs> so, the next one is 1939. Dawn, K7DHR. You get to choose. <laughs> if you don't have a Mac, then this is yours. What do you think, Dawn? Are you still there, Dawn? Are you muted? See, if Brent was here, he'd be playing the. Um, uh, Jeopardy theme, but <laughs> okay. I'm going to assume that Don's going to go ahead and take the, the wire strippers. Okay, which means Robert W7XEF is our next one. One, two, two, nine. You get the uh, MacBook Pro power supply. So, Robert, do you have a Mac or don't you? <laughs> I do not. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll replace this, but then Robert, there's something more you're liking, which I don't. Did anyone move? No. So Robert. Hooray. I have an idea. Let's keep up the good work. Remember when we were giving the away the, the, those the little computers? Very the computers. Sure. Are That's what you got for Ash, so Robert got this song. Give me your last floor as you dance. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, very good. Okay, congratulations, Robert. Yay. All right, and Don, I'll, I'll just give you the wire strippers. All right, now for the final two prizes. And uh, this is for, first of all, um, TYT TH UV88 transceiver. Very hefty little thing. It's, it's a pretty good quality radio. I've taken it. Anyway, I've talked about this before. It's a very, really nice little HD, five watts. Um, um, anyway, it's a powerhouse to me. I, I love it. it. It does, the antenna that it takes is like with the ASU, so it requires an antenna with an SMA male. Um, Belfang's taking an SMA female, so this will, will take a different one. Anyway, so. That goes to 4242. Ken James, KJ7QJJ, are you on? Yes, I am. Awesome. Congratulations, Ken. You are the proud owner of a new HP now. Congrats. Thanks. All right. Now, for the grand prize, the Parker's J4 with installation. I just hope I don't have to install it in California. <laughs> so here we go. 
six three six five. KJ seven YWF. Oh. Oh boy. Okay. okay. That that goes to Amber Sweeney. Congratulations, Amber. <laughs> she was in the chat. What is she on the chat? She was. So KJ7YWF. Amber, are you there? All right. Well, no matter what, Amber, you won. And um, congratulations. You won the grand prize of the J-Pool and installation. So cool, too cool for that. And that wraps it up. Congratulations, everybody. Thanks so much again to um, John and, and Ryan and Gary. Appreciate you guys' time. You did a wonderful job. And everybody joining us tonight, thanks so much for your time. And we'll, you know, we'll let you know what's going to happen in July. That's going to be up in the air. We're still trying to figure out what to do and what we're going to, where we're going to be. So I uh, will inform you all. And, in the meantime, seven three, you guys have a lot of fun, and we'll see you in person, like Carl said, on August fifth at the City Council Chamber Room.